take a look here at uh, the tide at sunrise. Oh, obviously, I ran through the rolls in the playthrough. The rolls are a bit of a, a pain in the ass, especially the naval rolls. There's no question there. Um, I guess the easiest thing to start with is the components. And I don't know what you can tell about a game when I first start with the components to it. But they are somewhat interesting. Um, rolls. Like I said, kind of a pain to deal with, largely because of a lack of play aids. Um, a good play aid for this game with some information on it would make these much less painful in terms of something that you have to keep referencing. They're not a good reference book. They're not very long, but they're still fairly difficult. There is one page on the back that gives some information, but most of this information is present on the map. <laughs> You know I gripe about glossy rules whenever I see them, this kind of glossy paper. It's because if there are any errors in it, I can not correct it with a pencil. Which means if I get the error wrong, or if the company changes what uh, their, their decision is on, on how to word something or whatever, I gotta write it in an indelible uh, script, uh, Sharpie, and then my rules are forever changed. They will never be able to be changed again. So if they made a mistake in their first correction, or if I make a mistake in writing it, I'm screwed. Terrible kind of paper. Never should be used. Um, and they could save some money by maybe not printing in color, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much color really helps, but it certainly is a big... Uh, negative to me to see these guys. Out. The counters, they're kind of nice actually. Um, I got nothing bad to say against the counters except for the fact that you get a whole bunch of them that don't do anything uh, in the rolls. What you need for that is one of the sets of naval rolls. There's an online set of naval rolls and these are pretty damn crappy. Uh, they may have been updated since then. I've seen the original Japanese rules, I believe, online, I will try them the next time I play it because these are pretty much shit and the intention is this dull little dice fest. There's very little. There's a game of Rochambeau as to, you know, what advantages you have in the battle and then you just roll bunches of dice. And to me, that is not a well-designed naval <laughs> sub-game. You also have to print out this little naval map. Uh, actually, you don't have to. You could just, you know, draw up some boxes or whatever. <laughs> but, yeah, you're not getting a complete game here. Um, you're getting part of the original Japanese game, slightly modified in terms of the land rules, and uh, basically completely rewritten naval rules. I don't know how good the Japanese naval rules are. I saw very few changes to the land game, but the naval rules seem uh, to be a complete rewrite and one that does not impress at all. Uh, it's kind of not really components anymore. By the way, those naval rule component, the the component of the naval rules, other than the fact that it's a you know print it yourself piece of crap, I, no thought, no effort was put into. Uh, getting a polished product out there because hey you know we're not paying to print a rule book so and nobody will gripe too much because it's online rules that's what you have to face if you ever start seeing companies stop including rule books in games is they'll throw out a piece of garbage to begin with <laughs> and fix it later what about the map now the map is gorgeous like i said the counters are, are nice and but the map is absolutely gorgeous but I found it nearly unreadable. There, it, it, functionally, it fails. Um, it, uh, you need really, really bright lights and great eyes to be able to see this thing. Things like the river line here. Hey, we're in nice dark lighting that I usually deal with. Uh, it's just very, very difficult to, to see, see what's going on on the map. Um, and not not very helpful uh, in terms of play. This is not a Simonson designed map which just kind of has visual beauty as well as functional <laughs> effectiveness. Um, 
And it's a shame when a map is uh, so pretty but unable unable to, to serve its function well. Yes, you can play on it. That's not a problem. What about the game itself? So, there's not a lot that's too exciting about this, except maybe the naval rules. The naval rules are interesting. However, they are so deeply flawed in this incarnation that I'm willing to give the Japanese rules a try. It looks like, uh, you know, that was a, supposedly a classic game. Um, you kind of don't get the feeling that naval rules that are so shallow and uh, ineffectual would be included in the classic game. Now, the base game of this says, hey, you just roll on a chart and see what happens for, for the naval engagements. So the rewrite of the naval rules, I don't know why it was even put in in a half-assed sort of way that it was, but it wasn't really intended for the game. They just made all the counters for it and figured they'd release rules for it later or something. The actual core of the game is pretty much a normal move and, and, and combat, almost operational feel game. Uh, very simple simple uh, design that everybody is largely familiar with. There are a few gotchas in here. Uh, I guess the biggest has to do with zones of control that nothing really cancels out a zone of control. So if you get stuck forward, you're screwed. You know? But then there's the you can remain in supply by advancing. You have a much richer set of combat results in this design, and I see why they had to be there, in part because of that zone of control rules. Um, you've got artillery, you've got rail movement, you've got all kind of little special stuff. None of that seems too exciting, but when you actually play it out on the board, um, the physical geography of this board is so interesting mixed with these rules, where there's a few choke points in the mountains um, near Korea, up along this mountain ridge here, that is where all supply has to go through, just because of terrain effects more than, more than the rules uh, design uh, situation. So basically what you have is a number of pathways, these roads that you can't see here, um, because the map is unreadable. Uh, <laughs> and then this shallow channel going up. And then the Japanese have the goal of taking Port Arthur over here, which is a tricky nut to crush because it's fortified. There's a fortified choke point here, and they can't get a lot of strength against it. They can just get two stacks of units against it. Chances are they won't be able to break the fort with that. Uh, recognizing that my play was okay well I'll wait until I have some artillery and you know I have a good chance of breaking through yeah you that decision <coughs> probably cost me the game to focus more on trying to push on other salients instead of in the Port Arthur area itself ended up uh, putting me in a really bad position where I could see I was not going to get Port Arthur by the end of the game unless of course I screwed up and didn't give the Japanese enough terms. But that's uh, a different situation. Um, I felt like I was on a path towards victory when you include the Togo points. But that's a key thing here. Without the Togo points, the Japanese get 10 bonus uh, points if you play with the optional naval roles, essentially plus whatever they can score in the, the naval combat, which looks like it's about equivalent to what you score off the chart. In terms of victory points, they have a set goal of 70 victory points they have to reach. Those 10 extra free points seem absolutely critical, and I think you should probably have 10 free bonus points <laughs> if you're playing uh, with just the uh, land rules and with the abstract and naval rules. I may be wrong, though. Uh, people seem to receive this game well in this version. I think it's rated differently than the original. Uh, as a different printing, as a different edition, completely separate. It should be. Um, there is a really interesting set of decisions that the Japanese especially have to make about how to get around those mountains, how to try to... Um, you know, whether or not to try to push through those passes and how 
much force to allocate to that, how much force to allocate to that northward channel, which is pretty much open, and how much force to allocate to Port Arthur itself. And that's a tough balancing act to make. I don't think the Russians have anywhere near as many interesting decisions, which is, you know, kind of a shame for a game that really is designed to be a, a clearly opposed game. They do have things to do, but those things to do are mainly reactive as far as I can see. Overall, uh, my view of this is this is pretty close to being a, a, a really kick-ass um, magazine game. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it feels to me like with a little bit of development work, etc., maybe the original version before MMP got their hands on it and started changing things was good enough uh, to match things like uh, Winter War that uh, SPI put out back in the 70s. Nice, simple, playable system. Uh, once you get a little used to it, you can start forming your strategy and, and you really feel like that's all you're working on. Where do I want to go? How do I want to do things? You're not dealing with a whole lot of mechanical stuff unless you throw those naval rules in. However, <laughs> as I've said, uh, some people have complained that the Japanese cannot win. A lot of people say they don't play with the naval rules. Those may be mutually uh, overlapping groups to a large extent in the sense that yeah, if you're if you're playing without that ten extra points, um, I think it would be tough. I think it would be real tough. I couldn't win with the Japanese in this, but I could see a path to victory had I played a little bit more cleverly. I could have played a little bit more cleverly with the Russians as well, though. And I saw some places where I erred with them. There's no question where my defensive lines were not set up in the best of places. So there is some clever decision, you know, there is some cool decision making to make with the Russians as to where to defend, how to defend. It's not cut and dry, it's not simple, you don't just sit down and say, ah, war game, yeah, put this here, put this here. Zones of control work a little bit differently than you'd expect. Pulling units off the front line to recover them, that's something I screwed up uh, and then rectified partway through the game. That can be a serious... Uh, factor to consider in each battle. Um, if you do, if you leave your units on the front line, you're strengthening your front line, but they're not going to recover there. And the recovery points, the handling of all that, that's some extra chrome in here that adds a lot to the game, uh, as do you know the decisions as to being able to land. So I kind of like the naval game because you're risking victory points to prevent uh, the Jap as the Russian to prevent the Japanese from being able to make a landing. What I don't like about the naval game is it's really lame. Uh, <laughs> playing it out. First of all, it comes to a Rochambeau like chit pick thing where you pick two chits, compare uh, the two players' choices of two chits and see what kind of advantage they have in the battle and then they just roll some dice out. Uh, it's too much die rolling I don't like that kind of chip picking type thing. Uh, and again, you know, this is a game that obviously is meant to be competitive in the sense that it has that chip pick. It has these kind of decisions that you kind of agonize over, at least as one of the players. Uh, but then the other player doesn't have as much to do. And that, that kind of troubles me. So I'd say this is a close, close to being a hit. Uh, close to being a good game. It... Leave some big questions in mind, though. Obviously, uh, you know, was the land game developed enough? I have to throw my hands up in the air about that question because I've only played it the once and I didn't play it well. Uh, so if people are going to say, hey, you know, the Japanese, they have about an equal chance of winning with just the land game. Well, then I, I'm willing to accept that that's likely to be the case given how screwed up the naval rules were and how poorly designed they were. Uh, on the other hand, there may have been complaints already coming in of, the Japanese can't win, what's with this game? You know? Uh, and if that's the case, uh, then maybe you need to throw that extra 10 points in if you're not going to play with the naval rules. It's a shame not to play with them because there's some interesting decisions in them, but it's also a shame 
how lame they made them, how, how weak they were. Uh, there's counters in the game for fuel for the, the ships. It looks like the maneuvers are meant to be done kind of in real time. Maybe there should have been like a little battle board or a space where you kind of, you know, are doing these actual maneuvers a la Jutland or something. I don't know, but what I end up seeing out of it just seems so weak compared to the components that you receive uh, to support the naval game. I do really like the decisions that you have to make in the land game, though. And I have the feeling that even if it is kind of unbalanced, if you throw that 10 points in, it probably balances it out. That's It felt balanced to me with the 10 points, but again, I haven't played it enough to be sure. Uh, it would be very difficult with the playing that I did to come anywhere near close to, to victory with the Japanese, I think. The Russians just have too much they can do to slow you down in various places. It would be, that extra padding would just be too easy for them to prevent uh, the Japanese from scoring the amount of points they need. Because the Japanese have to get a lot of points in this game. But that extra 10 points looks like about the right padding level, at least for my insight into the game from one play. But yeah, the uh, the actual the actual strategy involved in figuring out how you're going to attack with the Japanese on the land game is very very interesting, and then there are some cute little choices for the Russians, both defensively in terms of how to react to the Japanese advances, but even more so in the naval game in terms of whether or not you're going uh, to commit there. Unfortunately, the naval game sucks so bad that. I wouldn't play it as it stands. I want something richer. Um, it may have been that the naval game was too rich in the Japanese version. MMP and Starkweather decided, you know, the guys who are going to like this game aren't going to like that naval game. Yeah, but they all disregard this naval game too because it is just lame. <laughs> but yeah, the land game. The land game is very interesting. So throw out all those naval counters, and I don't know what you have. You have like a hundred counters to the game. Um, you have a pretty map and a short rule book, 12 pages. That's a magazine game to me, man, you know? Uh, and not, not even a late SPI uh, S&T magazine game, but one of those early little ones that came out with just, you know, 100 counters or so. All right. What, given what magazine games go for these days, though, this isn't a bad deal as a magazine game, if you want to compare it to other magazine games out there. You can't compare it to the S&T Glory days, you know, <laughs> 250 for for a subscription issue. What would that be nowadays? Maybe 10 bucks, you know. I'd pay 10 bucks an issue for, for magazine games. But they usually range around 20 to 30 bucks now. You can get this on sale new uh, in that range. It's interesting for that. It definitely is. There's so little on this subject matter. You know, <laughs> I want to get the SPI one. I don't remember what it's called. Maybe Russo-Japanese War. That's what I seem to think it was. Uh, but uh, that goes for a fortune. And of course, if Decision Games reprints it, it will probably do as bad a job as this was in terms of... Uh, you know, translating someone else's work into their own format. All right, up it goes. <laughs>